Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. Well, praise the Lord. Let us pray, then we'll just go to the word. Father, we thank you for we thank you for today. And we thank you for the presence of your spirit. We thank you for we know that your spirit will minister to the people. These people are your people, Lord. You died for them. You saved them. I believe it is a joy in your heart when we come together to worship you. And Lord, we pray that you will grant a blessing over your people and that you will open our hearts and open our ears so that, Lord, we can hear and that we can receive. We thank you for your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I was away for two weeks in Brisbane and uh, this was how I dress every Sunday and it feels good. I've been dressing like this ever since I was in New Zealand, so, so perhaps next time you might see me dressing like this, you might think I'm preaching, but I'm not. Sometimes it feels good, so hallelujah. Amen. And, uh, I'm going to preach something that has been in my heart and uh, I don't know how you're going to take it. But let's trust that, uh, you know, I've been around so long, so, you know, I've been talking with so many Christians here, so many different uh, ideas, teaching belief on the Word of God. And... Uh, I come to the conclusion that the Bible is just one and it's the same. But it's how we have different interpretation of the Bible. And uh, I encourage myself that it's something that God put into my heart so long that uh, as you believe, so shall it be done for you. And it's like, it's not how other people believed. It's what I believed in. And I believe that the life that you are living is the life of what you believed in. You know, some people believe that God is like this. And some people believe that God is like this. And I believe that's why we have so many different churches. And they are done in a different ways. It's because they all have different belief. But the most important thing is, is your belief or your interpretation of the Bible is the same as the interpretation of God. Because that is the most important thing. So many times, and uh, it's not a uh, judgment, it's not belittling other people or whatever, but some people, sometimes someone will come with something new, and they all change what they stand for and take this thing, because just because that person has got a name, has got a title. But I believe that, and so, so some people go that way, and then go the other way, go the other way, because they keep changing as people come. I'd just like to challenge you that what you believed in is what God, is the God that you will serve, and the God that will manifest himself to you. I've talked to a lot, I've talked a lot, I've seen a lot of churches back, you know, Simon churches, other churches, and I keep telling the church people that you will never find an accurate church or a perfect church in this world. 
we all have faults. I suppose the only time you'll find a perfect church is either at a cemetery where there's no people that are lying there have no more faults, <laughs> or when you go to heaven. Someone was once asked, why have you changed your church? You know, he was a friend of mine, he was a leader when I, in a group that I was in when uh, I became a Christian, and he said that people ask him, why have you changed your church? He used to be in the uncle camp. And now he has come to a Pentecostal uh, group and he said, why have you changed? And the guy said, well, I'm not saying that church is right than here, but the reason why I change is because I want to fellowship with people that we have the same belief. We do the same thing. Because if, you know, I believe in praising God, I believe in clapping, I believe in dancing in the church, so if I do that in here, you people will call me crazy. Your people wouldn't like it because that is not how we do it. So I change not because this, that's the right church or this church. I just change because I like to be where. If I raise my hands, I have the freedom to raise it. If I dance to God, I will have the freedom to do it. And I believe that is what is important to God. It's your freedom of serving the God that you know in your heart. But I just want to challenge you. If what you believe in has been proven wrong, then don't be afraid to change. Don't change for the sake of changing. But if you know that what you have been taught and what that has been brought down unto you is not right, then have no fear of changing. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and I look back now, I see some of the things that I preached 20, 30 years ago, I said, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong. <laughs> and then I, at that time, it was not wrong. At that time, it was right. It's just that as you grow mature in the spirit, God will show you more, just like when you are in school. When you were in primary school, you think that's the, that's it. You know everything. But when you go to university, then you find out that some of the things that was taught there, that's not the accurate. But at that level, God will speak to your heart. So don't just hold on and say, this is what I was taught. This is what our parents was taught. Go with the change as the Spirit of God tells you to change. Amen? So this morning I just want to speak on the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. Can you put that on please? Sir? I don't think that will work. I think I'm going to use... Uh, yeah. I think I'm going to use... Uh, David... Uh, what's that? Uh, the teacher, I use David Parker's remote when I click my hand, go to the next, uh, move to the next uh, thing. Yeah. Okay, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Last night he went to a wedding, most of, well, most of you, some of you, and you were served free course meal. Right? So our message this morning will be a free course meal. We'll have the entry, entry then we'll have the main course, and if we have time, we'll have the dessert. <laughs> so, okay, Luke chapter 10. Um, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. 
well, that's one of our messages, you know. Have you ever answered a question with a question? And this is what Jesus here, he was asked a question, and Jesus replied with a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question. And my encouragement to you, brothers and sisters, this morning, what is your hope as a Christian? Why have you become a Christian? Is it because of the healing? Is it because of, of uh, the blessings? Or whatever, whatever, because we have different reasons why we became Christians. Let me tell you, if eternal life is not your hope, then you better reject what is important to you because Christianity is all about eternal life. Relationship with God is all about eternal life. We have entered into a world that, is, that has been corrupt or is corrupt because of sin, and the Bible said everyone will die. And Jesus out of his mercy and, his, and God out of his mercy and love sent his son. Not so that we can have good houses, not so that we can have no more problems, but for us to be saved and taken out of death unto life. And we had a prophecy that come this morning that there are some people here that are starting to doubt or starting to question. Let me tell you, where will you get eternal life? And if you're going to give up on God now, how value is that thing compared to the eternal life that God is offering unto you? You know, there are times that we don't understand why things happen. There are times that we go through circumstances that no one understands. I've gone through so many times in my life and things that I just cannot understand why they happen. And I keep saying, God, I don't understand why this thing is happening, but please give me strength to go through. Perhaps later on I'll understand why it happens, and sure enough, later on I will, God will, I will be at a stage and God will point back into where I, I was facing difficulties, and I look at it, if that did not happen there, I would not have been where I am. Sometimes God put us through struggles, through pressure, to find out what is in our hearts. And when we overcome that and we keep on saying, Lord, I still trust you regardless of what is happening. Because in the future, we'll turn back and say, that was the turning point of my life. See, there were times when God would put us in a place where we, it's either a make or a break point in our life. And it's not going to be through blessings. It's going to be through trials and tribulation. And James says, happy are those that are facing tribulations because after the tribulation that you're going through is the testing of your faith. And after your faith has been tested and you have victory, then you will receive the glory that God has prepared for us. Hallelujah. Jesus, when Jesus preached, he did not say, if the wind comes, if the storm comes. He didn't say that. He said, when storm comes, when the wind comes, that means each and every one of us will have a storm that we face, will have wind that we will face, but he that is building his house upon the rock, that is Jesus Christ, he will stand every temptation and he will stand everything that comes in this life. Amen? So, how did I get there? It's not in my... <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. So the question was, Jesus asked the question, well, what is the Bible saying? What does the law say? And then he said, how do you read it? And I look at it, it's like Jesus said, how do you interpret the law? 
And the man says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love one another as you love yourself. Well, we all know that there were ten commandments that was given. But this man gave only two. What was he giving? He was giving his interpretation of the Lord. This is his understanding of the Lord. You know, so many times we argue about the iota, the words. You know, we go around and say, what's the meaning of this word? What's the meaning of that word? The thing is, I challenge you, look at the spirit of, the, of what God is saying. And God is saying, what is this, this man? How do you read the law? How do you understand the law? How do you interpret the law? And the man bring the law in two sentences. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Now, if you go and do that, then you will live. Hallelujah. That is the spirit. Let's have a look at, see, there was a time when Jesus See, what a time when Jesus was asked the same question by someone. What is the important command? And that, in the black, that is Jesus answering, Matthew, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is love your neighbor as thyself. Exactly the same as this man here answered Jesus. That was not Jesus answering in, in Luke. That was the man answering. And Jesus said, you, ex you are exactly right. That is exactly what God means when he brings the Lord. Hallelujah. See, have you ever seen it now? It's funny how you go to a courtroom and someone is bring up and is charged with breaking the law. And you know how funny that he is charged with one law and you have one lawyer arguing the law under another interpretation and another one arguing on another interpretation. One law but they have different interpretations. One says he's guilty, the other lawyer is saying no he's not guilty. And you know the important thing, the important interpretation is the, is the interpretation of the judge. Because the church is going to rule one way. So, you know, we all might have different interpretation, but the question is, is your interpretation the same as what is in the heart of God? Jesus is saying to this man, you know what is in God's heart. That is what God intended. Now go and do that thing, because if you do it, you will live. Amen? Then the man wanted to justify himself. And he said, then the man says, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus said, a Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and money, beat, up, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. Now we are serving the main course. <laughs> the man was on a journey. The life that we are living, we are in, we are living a life that we are on a journey. That journey started from the day that we were born, and that journey will complete when we die. Everything that happens to us, or that we are involved with, are all part of that journey. Everything that we have we've been called to do, are all part of that journey. Becoming a believer, it's a part of the journey. Being called into the ministry 
is a part of that journey. Your family life, your church life, your ministry life, your employment life are all part of a journey. That is how God created us. God created us to be someone. Someone that is different from another person. That is why Jesus said that God knows every hair in our head. And he will call us by name because in his eyes we are precious. And we are all part of what he do. Your life is not a coincidence. Being in the ministry is not a coincidence. Being called a pastor or wherever you're serving God is not an incident. It was all God's plan of your journey. Going through the suffering that you're going through is all part of that journey. Sometimes people take shortcuts in their journey. But sometimes we find out that the shortcut will end up becoming more expensive than doing the proper way. God has set a path in front of us. We might have to go through the narrow door, the narrow way, but it's all part of that journey. Through the journey, How did I go to the other? At some point in that journey, we shall come against bandits that will attack us. We might come to people that's going to rob us of the valuables that we have. We might come against things that will almost destroy our lives. Sometimes the things that we face in life will not kill us, but they will rob us of something that is so valuable to us that we are just as good as dead. Elijah went through that once. So powerful and mighty in God, but when Jezebel said that by this time tomorrow, if God make, make God do to me what you did to the prophets, if by this time tomorrow you are not dead, and he ran away and he said, God, I wish I was dead. You know, there will be times in our journey that we will say, oh, I wish I was dead. Remember when you crossed that time, Listen to the small voice that is talking to you. Be still and know that I am God. I have not forsaken you. I am still with you. Be strong, my son. Be strong, my daughter. I know your will. I know what you're going through. Have you seen that footprint thing that they have? You know? You might think that you are walking alone, but you're not walking alone. I am carrying you. Be strong. Be still. And that's a prophetic word from God for you that is going through your hard times. The devil comes to destroy. The devil comes to take away. But Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is here to give you life, to give you strength, so that you will continue on your journey and that you will reach the destiny that has been set by God for you. Be strong, don't give up, because the journey will only be completed when we die. And Jesus is waiting there saying that we are all running a race and we shall not be rewarded until we finish the race. So many people start the race, so many people are giving up on that race. Why? Because it's getting harder. It's getting harder. I don't know if I said this before here, but it reminds me of a story that I, I read. There was a race, the frogs were having a race, 
and it was tough, it was hard, and the race they had to go and then climb a tower, and the, the frog that reached the tower would, will win. And people, all the frogs were crying out, oh, you poor you, it's so hard, oh, give up, give up. And some started giving up because of the people, and there was one, this one frog that kept on going, smiling, and still going. He reached the, the tower, and he got the prize. And all the reporters, people want to know how, how he did it. Why didn't he listen to the people calling? They bring him, and then they found out that he was deaf. He couldn't hear a thing. You know, sometimes some people have some very good meanings, you know. Sometimes they come and give you advices. Sometimes we've got to be deaf to those advices. Because they only want to give us, like, comfort zone or have a good time on this life. Jesus is here to give us eternal life. Amen. Good times after bad time. Amen. I remember one thought that goes through my mind when I was... A new Christian. I look at everything and I look at things that I told myself that I've got to give up, sacrifice, give them away if I want to have eternal life. I look at all these things and the mockery that my friends and some people are giving me. I said, it's like God was saying to me, you know, everyone will have, everyone will have a hell and a heaven. And he said, you as a Christian, this, this earth is your hell. The people who are not believers, this is their paradise. And when we all die, that is where my heaven will come. And that's where their hell will come. Don't live on this earth like heaven. Be willing to go through suffering because your heaven, your paradise is coming. But we can live as people of the paradise here because God, Jesus said, let your kingdom come. We can live like people of the kingdom. And if, when you live like people of the kingdom, you will be persecuted. You will go through suffering. If you live like someone of the world, they wouldn't bother with you. Hallelujah. No one will bother with you because you are one of them. The devil will not bother with you. Because you're one of them. It's only when you mean your business with Christ and you walk with Christ, that is when you will face suffering and persecution. So, they kept this man, they stripped him. And then the story comes to three people that happen to come around. By chance, a Jewish priest come along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Oh, by the way, uh, June said this morning that there are paradox. This story here is a parable. It's a parable. And I love studying parables. I love meditating on parables. Because it's a make-up story by Jesus. And every time Jesus makes up a story, I try to follow it because there is a good meaning in that story. And I always look at all the people and the things that it happened in that story. So... Three people come around. First, the Jews, he says, the Jewish priest came over. And I just want you to imagine that you are seeing this story. Look at it as if a movie. They're seeing, we've got the priest coming over. He saw this person lying there. And then when he saw the person, he walked over, he saw the person, then he changed. And then walk here. Amen. And then the temple assistant comes. He saw the same person. He walked over, have a look, and then went the other way and continue. And I look at it and said, Why did Jesus say this? Why 
why did Jesus say this? And then I, I tried to figure, what is the priest seeing that make him change his direction? What is he seeing? What is in front of him? A man, according to the Bible, that a man that lies there half naked. Or, you know, let's, excuse me, but let's use the language that we're using now. A man lying there just in an underwear. Lying there half naked. What make him change direction? Was it because he was a high priest? Was there a rule in his culture that stops him from touching people that are naked? Because the Bible said that they are not... A, in the, the, the law says that they should not touch someone that is dead, that they should not touch a body that is dead. If they touch it, they are unclean. So what is why? Why didn't he help? Would he have changed his reaction if he came around and there were three men uh, hitting and beating this guy up? Would he have changed direction or, we, or would he have gone in and helped the man? What makes him change? Did he think that, oh, this is not my job, I'm the high priest, I better go and get the, uh, the temple assistant to come and give him help. I'm not qualified, you know. Why did he change? Why? And then the temple assistant came around. And then he again changes direction. See, sometimes what we see, sometimes we have a wrong interpretation of what we see. He must have looked at this guy and said, Oh man, oh, what a waste of life. This is what happened to the people that are drunk, people that spend all their money in beer. They don't, you know, what a waste of They don't need any help. Have you ever come across a pub and people coming out of the pub and say, oh, what a waste of time, what a waste of life. Sometimes we think like that because we are Christian. I remember hearing someone else back in the islands preaching that, oh, don't drink, it's bad. You know, it's bad, drinking beer is bad. I said to the guys, hey, don't you ever spray that again because I was a drinker. And before I became a Christian, I loved drinking because I know what the beer do to me. It makes me talk to the girls. And I love that. The only time that I will talk to a girl is when I'm drunk. Yeah. So don't tell them that it's bad. Should give them something else that they will know that what they have is bad, what you're offering is better. See, if you don't have an option of two things, You'll keep on doing the thing that you like. But when you have two options, you've got two things that you're going to choose, you can, have, you can have only one. Then you will look at which one will give you, is of more value to you. So don't tell them it's bad. Give them Jesus. Let them find out that it is bad. Hallelujah. So what made this man change his direction? I don't know, the Bible doesn't kill. But remember what Eli says when he saw Anna in the church and the way Anna was behaving? How dare you come drunk in the house of God? He thought that he, she was drunk. So sometimes what our eyes see and what we interpret might not be the true story. Sometimes people condemn other people because of what they see, but they never knew what is in the hearts of the people. Amen? We don't know what, what is in the heart of the people. And then the Bible said, Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt deep, pity or compassion kneeling beside him the Samaritan soothed his wounds with medicine and bandaged them then he put the man 
on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. So we have seen three people, and if I bring this free to our terms, and uh, if Jesus was telling this parable in our times, I think when, I don't think he will say a priest, but I just changed it and said, and then a pastor comes around. So I consider the priest to be the pastoral team. Then I look at the temple helper, so I will say deacons, worshippers, people that, you know, serves and administration, everything that, so both these people, people that represented God, come across this man that is on the road, but they didn't offer help. Then a despised Samaritan, so I will consider that a non-believer. Then a non-believer comes around, and I want you to have a look at the picture. They all saw the same thing, and they all changed directions. The priest and the temple helper changed direction, they move away. The Samaritan came, he changed direction, he moved towards the person that was lying there. How are you reacting to situations that you're going through? Are you moving away? Or are you drawn in here to be a helper? Very interesting, eh? Very interesting. If the two people that works in the temple saw someone that was lying there, and they, out of their own interpretation, move away. We don't want to help him. The Samaritan came, looked at it, and thinking to his heart, this man is in trouble. This man needs help. This man, if I don't help him now, his condition would be worse than what it is. James said to the church, if we have all the faith in the world and we come across someone that is hungry or is cold, not clothed, and we say, Brother, go in peace, God bless you, I will pray for you, and you go out and he said, if you don't give him something, what good is your faith? Faith, by word itself, worth nothing unless it is accompanied by work. Faith has a body, faith has an action, and your reaction to things will reveal the kind of faith that is within you. So this Samaritan looked at this man, he looked at it, he changed his direction. Instead of moving away, he moved towards him, he got off his donkey, went over, Pour oil and pour wine over it. You know, it's funny when I look at wine and oil. This was like, this was, this, this uh, translation said, and he soothed his wound with medicine. King James said, oil and wine. Looks like oil and wine were the medicine <laughs> in those days. Hey, what does the Bible teach us as the church about the, war, the oil and wine? The Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus. Interesting. And he poured oil and wine over the man. What did he do? He helped the man out of what he had. He had something that he can give, and he gave. I believe that when we come into a situation like this, we have each and every one of us will have something in our hand that we can apply as an initial help to people that we can give. We have the oil and we have the wine. See, the Bible says that we are the body the church of the believers is the body of Christ. 
Amen. I believe that Jesus does not have a body. He's not in the body, in the flesh now. But the believers are his body. And Jesus is telling, is saying to us that I want to use your wallet as my wallet to reach out to the people. I want to use your hands as my hand to reach out to care for people. I want to use you, I want to use your mouth to speak to speak hope to that young girl or that young man that is going through a hopeless situation that is just about to commit suicide. I can't speak to him, but you, my believer, you, my son, my daughter, I want you to be my mouth to speak to them. We have something that we can use for God to help someone that is in need. Help is not just money. Help is your action. By just cuddling someone, putting your arm around that people, you don't know how much that will have an effect on someone's life. Sometimes we don't need to fast. Sometimes we don't need a prayer meeting. Sometimes we just have to use the Spirit of God that is within us and allow God to work through you. The first reaction of this man was to use what he had. He had the oil and wine in him and he used this. Make sure that initial need is supplied for and is given up. Then he attended to the second one. You know, sometimes we have a new, well, I don't know about here, but I remember back home in New Zealand when I became a Christian, we go and we went through counseling situations where we, when people come and receive the altar call and we were trained how to speak to them after the, after they stand here to counsel and we were told, you know, tell the people to give up smoking, tell the people to give up drinking and all those things we give up. And I realized, you know, apply the main thing first. Cut off the person, bring them in, let them feel the love of Christ in them. Hallelujah. So we've got in our hands, this man used what he had to apply the help that was needed. Hallelujah. Church, and it's to me, I look at it myself too and I say, you know, let's not allow the hat that we are wearing to prevent us from helping people when we are there to help them. There's so many times people will say that is not my job to do. I get someone that we, oh, we've had this person to look at that. I'll go and get that person. And this is the fear sometimes that we might have. The hat that we are wearing. I remember doing all the course that I was doing. The, the uh, oh, escaped my mind. What's that course? Yeah, the chaplain C course that I was doing, sign of old age, eh? and we were told how we deal with someone that comes and needs things out, you know, someone wants to say, oh, someone wants some money to go to Brisbane for a funeral or something, how we can help. And he said, oh, no every, every agency that we can pass. And I said, man, why should I put them all through those agencies when the easiest way I can help that person, if I have $100 in my pocket, give it to them. I said, oh, but you can't do it. You're a chaplain. You can't give people money. And that thing is at all. You know, sometimes the hats that we are wearing might prevent us from giving the help that Christ has called us to give. Hallelujah. I believe that this too moved away, not held because of the hat that they were wearing. <coughs> you know, sometimes we react to things Something happened to me in New Zealand, in Sambo, a long time ago, I think when I must have been 20 at that time, or no, 18. I was sitting at our homes around 12 o'clock at night. I was doing something, I don't know what I was doing, then all of a sudden I hear someone crying out on the road. Help me, help me, someone help me. They are, they are hitting me, they are beating me. I heard this sound, and it sounds to me like it was my uncle that was calling out. Help me, help me. And I just grabbed the lamp, and I ran outside, and I ran to the road. Then I got there, 
the guys that have beaten him must have seen the light coming and then they, they ran away. So I got there and then other people came in because they all hear the cry. Three minutes later, I was shaking. I was scared. I said, man, I could have been killed here. I was running with a light. Those guys would, have fought, they would know that I am a witness. They could have just thrown stones and killed me. But at the time that I reacted, I never thought of that. The only thing that was in my mind, this man needs help. And I was going to give them help. You know, sometimes we are afraid of what's going to happen to us. And that will stop us from giving help. Now that I'm a Christian and old, I said, I, I believe, I said, thank God. I, when I became a Christian, I think back, I said, God, thank you. I know you protected me there. Because I could have died there. So sometimes, you know, things that are in our way might stop us from giving help to the people. I better go to the dessert. And the next day, he landed, he handed the innkeeper two pieces of silver and told him to take care of the man. If the bill runs higher than that, he said, I'll pay the difference the next time I am here. Come with me to the book of Hosea. Just go through to the... Hosea says, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rain, like the spring rain that water the earth. Amen. How do you interpret that statement? To me, it's like Hosea is saying to the people, Come, let us return. To me, that means where they are now is worse than where they were before. He would not have used return if they were not at another place. I said, come, let us return. That means they are now at a place that is now worse than where they were before. If you are here and you're someone that has been with the Lord and now you are drifting away from the Lord study and now you are in trouble, the Bible is saying to you, or you must have an attitude to say where I am now is worse than before. Because if you never know that where you are now is worse than before, you will never change. Some people can look at you and think, oh, you are worse than before, go back to the Lord. But some people say, oh, I am all right where I am. Unless they tell themselves that they are worse now, no change will happen. So, Hosea is saying to the people, we are worse here. He's saying, God was protecting us over there, but now we are here. You know, it's amazing what he's saying. He is staring us. Is God actually tearing them? God is allowing trouble to come to tear them up. See, we were under his protection before, but now we are not under his protection. We are having trouble. Amen? He's saying that we were happy where we were. God was happy with us where we were than where we are now. And now I say, come, let us return. Let us return to God. Hallelujah. Verse 2 says, after two days, he will revive us. After two days, he will revive us. I think that speaks of God's restoration period. And when I put these two together, 
the Samaritan went out, grab, uh, apply the water, the oil, and the, and the wine, take this man into the inn, and then when he left, he gave the money to the innkeeper and said, this is the money for you to, to you know, look after this man, and if there's any more money later, I will repay when I come back. It's the process of restoration. See, God does not just save us. God will put us through a restoration period. Changing is not an automatic thing that just happened overnight. You cannot come to God today, receive salvation today, and all of a sudden, everything changed. There is a process of restoration. There is a process of restoration. There is a process of where we can bring back to where we were before. We have gone through this suffering. So this man says, let us go back to the Lord. And he says, in two days time. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will restore us. Amen. You might say, well, God, why do I do? You know, I believe that you have accepted me back, but why am I still suffering? You are going through a process of restoration. And before you are put back and restored to where you were before, you are going through that process of restoration, bringing you back strength, bringing you back into a place where you will be able to stand again on your two feet serving God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Reminds me, remind, this reminds me of what happened to the parable that Jesus speak about the prodigal son. He went out doing his own will and then when he was feeding the pigs and eat the food of the pigs then all of a sudden he realized that where he was is better than where he is now. Where he was, he had serve, servant to serve him, he had food, but now he is eating with the pigs. He knows the difference of the two life church uh, friends, brothers and sisters. If you don't know the difference between the life of this world and the spiritual life, there's something wrong that I believe that you have not reached where God wants you to reach. Because Paul says, all that I consider good to me before now, I consider rubbish. If the things of this world are still of value unto you, you still have not got the God that Paul is talking about. Change the whole life. And this prodigal son, the, the, the younger son, looked at it and said, Man, my, my God, my father's servants are living a better life than me. Then he make a decision. I am going to go back. Just like what people who are saying. Those people stand where they are. They said, let us return. And when, they, uh, and when the, the prodigal son stood up and started, the, the moment that he started walking back to his father, that was the moment his restoration started. Because he has acted on what he was in his mind. It was fully completed and he was restored back into where he was the time that he reached his father. Did it take him two days or three days to get to his father? There is a period there. And we have to walk through that period of restoration. You know, your life, your blessings start the day that you make it your decision that I'm going to give Jesus my life. I'm going to ask Jesus to come into my life. The time you say that prayer, that's the time God will start the healing process in your life. And some people, because of where we were, that might take a year. Some people, they were closer, might take two years. You know, have you noticed that the worst people are the people that had come out of a religious spirit? People who was close to the land, they are the worst people. The people that really cause for the Lord are the people that has been saved from the gates of hell. They don't want to go back there. 
So you might be going through a process of restoration now. Friends, see, God's mind is not to leave you on the side of the road being robbed. You might have been robbed, you might have been attacked by people, but let me tell you, God still so loves you. And the process of restoration is waiting for you. The time that you said, Lord, I am coming back to you, that's the time where the, 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 the restoration process of God started. It will be fully restored. It was fully restored to the prodigal son when he reached home. Our journey is not finished, brothers and sisters. It will only finish when we die. Be strong. The Lord is with you. You will strike down. You will suffer. But no. You and you as a Christian, Jesus, uh, Paul says to the Galatians, you who are spiritual, when you see a brother or a sister falling into sin, where they will die, reach out, help them. You know, there's one thing that I have noticed in some other Christian. I don't know about you. I hope it's not happened to you. I've seen some people, I've seen some families broken up. A man might have an affair or the woman might have an affair and end up the family's broken. And the other Christian will turn to town, you know, that sister was a very good friend. They were talking everything. But when that sister fall and move away, her Christian friends will keep a distance. When they did not help. Sometimes we make that error. You, the Bible, Paul says to the church, you who are spiritual, when you see a brother or sister sinning, go over and help them. Pull them out. Save them. And that is our job as children. You know, one good thing about this parable to me when I read it, like I said, it was an answer to who my neighbor is. But the way I interpret it, it's how I should serve God. It's how I should serve God. It's what I should do when God put me in situation. So it's not really, to me, it's not really who my neighbor is, but to me, it's as a pastor and as someone in the ministry, how should I serve God? I should not allow the hat that I am wearing to stop me from giving the help that is needed. Let's all stand. Can I have the uh, band, please?